Unpopular opinion, I like how Alicia was handled in Tales of Zestaria. Ever since the game's release, there has been an ongoing controversy surrounding Alicia, from being advertised as the game's heroine despite her short screen time, to being badly written in the game, many fans have complaints about the way Alicia and her story were handled. These complaints went so far as to convince the creators of the game to try to quote unquote fix Alicia through DLC and adaptations. However, whether she was truly helped or hindered in these attempts is debatable. In this video, I'm going to critically analyze Alicia's handling in Tales of Zestaria, the Alicia Story DLC, the manga A Time of Guidance, and the anime Tales of Zestaria The Cross. By the end, I hope to come to a conclusion on which adaptation handled Alicia's story the best and whether she truly needed to be fixed at all. As always, this video will contain spoilers for Tales of Zestaria. There will also be spoilers for Alicia's DLC, the anime, and the manga. Now's the time to turn back if you want to avoid those. Also, I'm aware that this is a controversial topic, so please keep in mind that these opinions are all my own and are not representative of everyone who has experienced Tales of Zestaria in any way. I just felt like I couldn't analyse this game without taking a moment to focus on this issue, which has become so prolific in reviews of the game and attached media. In any case, I hope you enjoy the video! Alicia, as we know her in the game, is a kind, naive, and stubborn princess knight who will do whatever it takes to protect her country in this age of chaos. At the beginning of the game, we see as much in the fact that, despite her falling hopes about whether anyone safe for a legendary hero could truly do anything to improve the state of the world, she still continues on. She actively searches for these legends in the hope of those being her solution, and even when her search seems to come up short, she continues working for the sake of her dream. The game builds her up to be similar to Saray in many ways making her a good first human for him to meet. They both enjoy the shepherd myths, believe wholeheartedly in the seraphim, and will do whatever it takes to attain their dreams. If we're making the zest joke again, I suppose they both have that kind of energy needed to keep going, despite all odds. Perhaps it is this, then, which makes it feel somewhat frustrating when Alicia leaves the party in Marland, a mere ten hours into the game. It may feel almost like she is giving up on journeying with Saray and the others, leaving him to accomplish her dream while she works from the sidelines. After all, it is the manner in which she leaves the party which many players have reportedly complained about in terms of Alicia. Yet, it makes sense in terms of storytelling. Aside from the obvious reason for her leaving, the fact that she is hurting Saray by being his squire, as a princess, it would make little sense for her to continue journeying with him. Though she is low-ranking and her superiors do not care where she goes so long as she is not interfering with their plans, it would contradict her character and story arc for her to go with them to Roland's. She wants to be taken seriously by the chancellors and to do her best for her kingdom. This is something she cannot do in another country. In fact, going with Saray might have made things worse for her, both in terms of her status and her dream. This is something which was expanded mostly in the DLC and manga, but Alicia's dream does not consist only of travelling with the shepherd as his squire. Though that definitely helps to remove some of the malevolence, it is not her place to continue on Saray's journey with him. Alicia realises that there is something only she can do, and that is to use what little power and standing she has as a princess to work hard in her home kingdom, improving everything she can and trying her best to stop her government from creating situations which might provoke an influx of malevolence from the populace. After all, it is made clear in her apologies to the Seraphim that she believes it is the fault of the royal family that so many have strayed from the noble path. Though her actions inevitably anger the Chancellors more than anything, it is her naive determination which makes her continue, in the hopes that she will be able to change things from the inside, while Saray does his best to continue on his own shepherd's journey. There is another reason why it makes sense for Alicia to depart from the party at this point, and for her not to return. She cannot armatize. This is another issue which there have been complaints about, since people believe it detracts from her character. Conversely, I believe it sets up a nice contrast between Alicia and her successor, Rose. Alicia is a wholehearted believer in the Seraphim with little resonance, and Rose has the potential for incredible resonance, but is held back by her fear and lack of will to believe in the Seraphim. If Alicia is meant to compliment Saray's hopes in the world, World, Rose is meant to show him the reality of things. After all, this is something Alicia cannot accomplish since much of her own story is to do with the idea of reality and truth. From a less storytelling based perspective, it makes sense for Alicia not to be a main party member as you head further into the game. From my own experience, I know that she ultimately dies often in battle, and since she cannot be revived by the Seraphim through amortization, it ends up costing a lot of life bottles to keep reviving her. In addition, we do not have access to resurrection arts, unlike in previous Tales games. If we had to deal with this issue throughout the entire game, Alicia may have become a far less likeable character simply for her frailty in battle, and yet it would remove a core part of her character and her conflict with Saray for her to have the ability to armatize. As such, the decision to remove her from the party in exchange for a human who can armatize was one which I believe is justified by storytelling. 
Of course, this does not remove the issue of her being reintroduced to the party for one of the most difficult boss fights in the game. At this point, Alicia's story is reaching its emotional climax. She has been working so hard, yet she is still not being taken seriously, to the point where the Chancellors have been provoked into warfare once more. Everything she does seems to be for nothing, and her only hopes lie in Saray's abilities as the Shepherd and the support of her lifelong mentor and mother figure, Maltran. Except, as we all know, Maltran is a backstabbing hellion. The battle with Maltran presents us with Alicia's lowest moment in the game. We see her fall apart as it is revealed to her that her mentor has been betraying her, and Maltran kills herself on Alicia's blade after making it known just how much she hates her. With everything happening all at once, it is no wonder that Alicia breaks down, wanting everything to end simply because it feels like all hope is lost. Her brief reconciliation with Saray is a little disappointing in its shortness, but it allows Alicia to find perspective once more. Saray reminds her that she does care for the world, and wants to see an end to this war. A Alicia finds the resolve to keep going despite the pain she has endured. The ability to strive on through hardships is a core part of the game, and so this section ties nicely into the main story arc as well as moving Alicia's story towards its conclusion. From a storytelling point of view, it makes sense for her character and brings Alicia's story together strongly. That isn't to say there aren't problems with this part, of course. The fact that Alicia returns for 30 minutes of gameplay is more aggravating than anything, mainly due to the fact that the player has gotten used to an armatized second human character, and Alicia is difficult to farm equipment for in order to make her not die instantly in battle against Maltran. However, more than anything, this is a gripe with the game's battle system. The story may have worked better animated rather than as a playable fight, simply because of the frustrating nature of fighting a boss like Maltran with Alicia in the party. Maltran's being a Hellion is another issue. It must have been complained about, since Maltran is not a Hellion in either the manga or the anime. And to be fair, in the game, it feels more like a plot device than a true part of her character. The fact that Maltran is betraying Alicia works to advance Alicia's character arc, but with only a small amount of information on Maltran's past, it's difficult to understand exactly what her motives are. If the game focused more on Alicia and allowed time to see more of Maltran's past and her relationship with Alicia, then perhaps this part of the story would have been handled better. However, I think with all the side quests in the game, it does its job of giving information to the player without spoon feeding them every piece of information possible. The player is allowed to think through these issues for themselves, and it is aspects like this which cause analyses like this to be written in the first place. After her leaving the party for the second time, she shows up only for a short time at the battlefield and in Lastenbell, which is to be expected. These moments are used to wrap up the story between Alicia, Sergei and the Warring States, after all. They set in stone how motivated Alicia is to continue doing her best in order to achieve her dream. All in all, I believe the game handles Alicia's character arc fairly well. In terms of storytelling, everything that happened makes sense for her character and pushes her story along in an engaging direction. The main issues with Alicia's handling in the game come more in the territory of game mechanics and the experience of actually playing the game. If her story had been portrayed exactly the same way in the anime, perhaps Alicia's arc in the game may have been better received and more people would feel that her story was written well. Except, due to the backlash against Alicia, changes had to be made. Bandai Namco came out first with Alicia's post-game DLC, which is meant to give closure to Alicia's character as well as allowing more time for the audience to interact with her. However, with the DLC consisting mostly of a long, tedious dungeon of over 10 floors, it's no wonder that it wasn't well received. Besides, it seemed to change Rose's character pretty starkly, having her act rudely towards Alicia despite her earlier politeness towards her in the main game. Fighting with her becomes easier with the ability to find new equipment for her, but once again, she doesn't enjoy the benefits of armatization, which many players prefer over her fighting style. It also sets up a new conflict for her, one which feels almost forced due to the conclusion of her previous conflicts in the main game. Though it makes sense in terms of story that she would be considering her place in the world after fulfilling her dream of a peaceful highland, it feels too much like compensation for her not having been as prevalent in the main game. At the very least, Alicia's DLC gives more insight into the state of the world after the game, as well as developing her relationships with other other female cast members and giving her much needed closure on the Saray situation. However, in terms of gameplay, it is disappointing due to its tedious nature. Her story isn't changed much in the manga, save for it being shortened due to constraints on space in the four volume set. Alicia's arc lasts largely through the first two volumes, and she makes a final short appearance in the fourth as a sort of resolution to her story. In the manga, her struggle with finding her duty is shown more clearly, particularly in the pages which depict her in contrasting positions. One image shows her as a princess fulfilling her royal duty alongside Maltran, and another shows her clinging onto Saray, trying to escape 
escape the pain of her reality. In the end, she is swayed most by the memory of herself as a child, one who loved Lady Lake and wanted to see it become a happy place. Along with a clearer depiction of Saray's sight problems due to the Squire's Pact, the way Alicia's struggles are handled in the manga gives more insight into her issues without expending the same amount of time needed for the game to do the same thing. Yet this makes sense. With less time and space, her story needs to be condensed, whereas giving it a longer run in the game allows the player not to completely forget about her while they're off saving the world as Saray. One thing the manga really hammers home is the idea of how much it pains Alicia to leave the party. By showing her fascination and awe at the Seraphim and the power of purification, it makes the reader understand just how much this journey means to Alicia. After all, this is the stuff she's dreamt about since she was a child. Being a part of that feels like a dream to her. And yet, as the reality of the world settles in around her, she begins to understand her place in the world and where she needs to be to make her dream come true. This, more than anything, makes her story in the manga feel well done, despite her still leaving the party for the majority of the manga thereafter. The true outlier comes in the form of the anime, which puts a major focus on fixing Alicia by changing her story completely. No longer does she have a limited amount of resonance, it grows throughout the anime to the point where she can armatize by the end, something which could only be done in the game by those with power on par with the Shepherd himself. If Alicia always had that potential within her, it is difficult to understand why she couldn't pull the Shepherd's sword herself, though the anime gives the excuse of her resonance growing thanks to Saray's influence, and yet Saray's lending to her of his power does not harm him in the anime, something which is not explained and makes little sense. In any case, the anime creates a stronger link between Alicia and Saray, mostly to keep her relevant in the story. She literally has a psychic link with him at one point. The anime takes many other such liberties, including the fact that she can remain Saray Squire despite being out with his domain of influence. These are nitpicks, however. The point is that the writers of the anime thought it important to make Alicia more powerful in order to keep her relevant to the story and relevant to Saray's mission. This is somewhat understandable, but it removes a large part of what made her character interesting in the game. She still has the same core values in the anime, but without the flaw of a low amount of resonance, it feels as though she should have no problem overcoming her problems. In fact, the anime removes many of her flaws and weak points in order to improve her character, with the effect of making her seem in invincible instead. She faces her lowest point at the very beginning of the anime, losing many people she cares about to horrible natural disasters before getting lost and winding up in the Mount Mabinogyo ruins. She goes as far as to desperately ask if Saray is the shepherd, which serves only to show just how far her desperation and hopelessness goes at this point. Alicia always finds a solution or solace after she leaves Alicia and Saray becomes the shepherd. When she feels low, she hears Saray's voice and finds motivation in a rather anticlimactic moment. She doesn't lose nearly as much at that point as she did in episode 0, so it makes little sense for that moment to be portrayed as though it's an even lower point for her. She does not fall or fail once, despite her knack for making things worse in the game. Even when she faces the King and Chancellor Bartlow, she has her comrades standing outside, a foresight which makes her seem far more tactical than she is in the game, where she tends to face her problems head on without thinking of all the negative consequences first. In short, the anime removes Alicia's flaws and gives her power-ups, which only impairs her character development. This, of course, is something the anime does with many of the characters, but that's an argument for another time. With the changes made to Alicia's character in the anime, I cannot truthfully say that I think her character was handled better in that adaptation. Rather, I believe it was worsened by it. All in all, Alicia's character arc is something which changes largely due to the backlash against her brought on by poor marketing and a lack of consideration for gameplay mechanics. The most straightforward and perhaps most honest depiction of Alicia's character arc is shown in the manga, but the main game does a good job of developing her character, though the method of doing this could have been improved by taking into account her role in battle, particularly in the Alicia DLC. But that's just my opinion. Once again, I know this is a controversial topic and one which many people have spoken about before. Still, I thought it was important to cover this topic here so I could share my views on the subject and hopefully explain why I think Alicia is well written in the game. Feel free to disagree with me on any of my points. I'd love to hear what your opinions are down below. I welcome all thoughts, theories and opinions. If you want to hear me trash the anime a little more, you should check out my peas in a pod analysis about Saray and Mikleo's relationship in Tales of Zisteria adaptations. I also have three other analysis videos and I will link a playlist containing them in the usual places. If you want to hear me attempting to make interesting commentary and likely complaining about the Maltron boss fight, I have a Let's Play of Tales of Zisteria which you might be interested in. At the time of uploading, it is on its 52nd episode. We're really getting into the final stretches of the game, so feel free to check it out if you like. I try to do more analysis there too. It'll be linked in the same places. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great day, night, or whatever the time it is for you. And I will see you next time.